Well, if you have a Bible with you, let me encourage you to hold it up right now and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth for what we believe and how we live. Now, open up your copy of God's Word with me this morning to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, hardly a day goes by that I don't read a report, I don't see a, a news report about something unjust, unfair fair, something hard to explain happening in our world today. But the reality is bad things do happen to good people. They happen to godly people, Jesus-loving people. You see, our relationship with Jesus doesn't inoculate us from the pain and the problems and the suffering of the world. I believe the opposite is true. I believe many times it's our relationship with Jesus that is the spark that ignites the suffering, the persecution the pain in our life. And that's why Peter wrote this letter. He wrote it because he knew that, that the believers he was writing to were going to be going through immense suffering and persecution. And he wanted to prepare them for that. But not only did he want to prepare them for that, he wanted to help them live victoriously in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their persecution. Now, that's something that many of us in this room don't understand today because here in America, we haven't faced a lot of persecution. But, but throughout the world, believers are facing persecution today. And for most of the history of the church, it hasn't been safe to be a Christian. There is a book written by Stephen Neal. The book is entitled, The History of Christian Missions. And in that book, he says, that in the first three centuries of the church, this is his quote, every Christian knew that sooner or later he might have to testify to, the, to his faith at the cost of his life. Did you hear that? During the first three centuries of the church, every Christian knew that at some point he may have to testify or she may have to testify about their faith at the cost of their lives. And when these believers shared the hope that they had in Christ, it had nothing to do with living a pain-free, problem-living life in the here and now. Because you see, their hope wasn't based in the here and now. They were looking for a new kingdom. And they were looking for a new king. And the reality is, most places around the world are facing that kind of existence today. The norm is not to be safe and comfortable as a Christian. The norm is to face persecution for being a Christian. But I want us to answer some questions before we dive into this passage because if you look at, at suffering, you discover that suffering comes for a variety of reasons today. First, there is natural suffering. Natural suffering is the result of living in a fallen world. We live in a world that's been been corrupted, it's been, it's been um, infected by sin, and because of that, our bodies wear out. We get sick, and eventually we die. Because we live in a corrupt world, and the entire world has been corrupted by sin, we have natural disasters. And these natural disasters devastate people, and they devastate places. And because we live in this corrupt world, there is financial instability. And people lose their jobs and businesses close down. That's natural suffering. The suffering that we face because we live in a fallen world. And then there is suffering because of the choices we or someone else makes. You see, the Bible teaches that there are consequences for the decisions we make. There are consequences for the choices we make. We reap what we sow. We don't handle money wisely and we may live in poverty. We cheat on our spouse, and we may lose our family. We abuse alcohol and drugs, and we may lose our health, or worse, we may lose our life. And so there is suffering because of the choices we make and because of 
what others, uh, the choices others make. But then there is suffering simply because we follow Christ. And that's what Peter is talking about in this letter, this epistle. Now, Peter begins this section with a question in verse 13. Notice what he says. He says, now who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? Now, that's a valid question, isn't it? I mean, who is going to want to harm you if you're eager to do good? If you want to live your life with integrity, if you want to treat people fairly, if you want to do what's right, then you would naturally assume that no harm would come your way. And and the truth is, oftentimes, that's correct. But we also know that bad things do happen to good people, and sometimes they happen simply because we are good people. And that's what Peter is talking about here. He's talking about suffering for doing what is right. We have spoken up. We have stood up for righteousness. And the result of that has been suffering. Later on in chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going to face as if something strange is happening to you. Peter says, don't be surprised. It shouldn't shock you. When suffering comes, it's not strange. It's what is to be expected. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul made it clear that without exception, there will be persecution if our desire is to live a godly life. Jesus said it this way. He said, since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. Jesus said, since they persecuted me, don't be surprised. It's coming. They're going to persecute you. Uh, there's, a, there's a little quote that's come out through history called the fate of the apostles. And, it, and it's what tradition says has happened to the apostles in the first century. Listen to what it says. Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword in Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the city to his death. Luke was hung on an olive tree in Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil but escaped death and afterwards was banished on the island of Patmos. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James the Greater was beheaded In Jerusalem, James the Less was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and then beaten with a club. Philip was hung against a pillar in Hyopolis. Bartholomew was flayed. His skin was literally peeled off of his body while he was still alive. Andrew was put on a cross and he preached to those who nailed him there until his death. Thomas was run through with a spear in the East Indies. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was stoned to death first, and then he was beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death. And Paul, after being tortured in a variety of ways, was beheaded in Rome. As a believer, you need to understand that you are on a collision course with suffering because the God of this world and this world itself is opposed to the God that we know and love and serve. Our suffering may come from our job, it may come from school, it may come in the neighborhood, it may even come from home. But the Bible says if we seek to live a godly life, we will suffer persecution. It's inevitable when we take our beliefs and we take our values into the world, the world is not going to understand. Now, we haven't experienced a lot of suffering here in America. But in other parts of the world, it is a normal part of life. Now, notice what Peter said next in verse 14. He said, but even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threat. So Peter says, in spite of certain suffering, don't worry. Don't be afraid trouble don't get stirred up it won't do you any good and then he says don't be afraid look at me don't be afraid don't be afraid 
God tells us that. As a matter of fact, he commands that over and over in Scripture. 360 times in Scripture, there is the command, fear not. You need to understand that either your fear is going to overcome your faith, or your faith is going to overcome your fear. The two cannot coexist in the same space. But Peter doesn't just say, don't worry and don't be afraid. He says, be happy. Now, depending on what translation you have, verse 14 says this in the Greek. This is what it says. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, blessed are you. Happy are you. The Greek word for blessed or happy that Peter uses here is the same word that Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount when he gave the Beatitudes. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. All of the Beatitudes. Happy are you. Blessed are you who do these things. You see, Peter is telling us that we can have a happiness that is independent of what happens to us. It's independent of the things that we have in this world. And the world doesn't understand that. The world is looking for its happiness through the things of this world. The world looks for happiness through good times, good things happening to us. But but Peter says we can be happy in the midst of suffering. Now, in our mind, suffering is the opposite of God's blessings. But that's not true. You see, oftentimes God's blessings are delivered to us wrapped in suffering. And so if you're suffering today because you are seeking to live right, for Jesus, how about do this? Instead of moaning and groaning and crying out to God, why, why don't you try rejoicing and asking God what? What is it that you want to do in and through me through this suffering? Because here's what I know. God uses everything for our good if we love him, if we're called according to his purpose. Peter says in chapter 4, be very glad for these trials will make you partners in Christ's suffering. And then he says, be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian, for then the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. So, how can we be happy in the midst of suffering? Because that's basically what Peter is teaching us in this section. In the midst of the suffering, the persecution, the pain, the trouble, the anguish that we face, We can be happy, but how? Well, I believe that Peter gives us at least four things that can help us to be happy, to experience blessings in the midst of suffering. Here's the first thing. Worship Christ as Lord of your life. Listen to how he began verse 15. He says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Now, the word for worship here isn't the the Greek word for coming together to sing and and celebrate, and pray, and give, and do all the things that we do in corporate worship. That's not the word here. The the word here is hagiazo. It literally means to set apart. When something was hagiazo, it was set apart fully for God's use, fully for God's glory. And so what Peter is saying here is don't just give Christ the first place in your heart. Don't just give Christ the first part of your heart. Set apart your heart solely and completely for him. Let him have all of your heart. And the truth is, you're never going to make it through the suffering that will come, much less rejoice in the midst of suffering unless you have surrendered your heart and life completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you set apart Christ as Lord, you understand it's not about you. It's about him. And the problem with much of the Christianity in our world today, and especially in America today, is we have a Christianity that is a a me-driven form of Christianity. Jesus came to make me happy. Jesus came to make me healthy. Jesus came to make me wealthy. Jesus came to take all my problems away so that I can have a good life here on this earth. But what you need to understand is it's not about me. And it's not about you. The Bible says it's about him and so we surrender our hearts 
completely to him and we say, I am yours, Lord. Do with me as you please. Let me ask you a question. Do you trust him enough with your life? Do you trust his love for you enough to fully surrender it all to him, believing that he has your best in mind? And your best in mind may take you down a path of suffering. It may take you down a path of pain. It may take you down a path of heartache. But do you trust him enough to surrender it all to him? And set apart your life fully and completely to him. That's the first thing he tells us we have to do. Worship Christ as Lord of our life. And then as verse 15 continues, he tells us we must tell others about our hope in Christ. Listen to what he says, um, continuing in verse 15 and following. He says, and if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you have lived because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. And so Peter, in this section, tells us that we need to be ready to tell people the hope that we have in Christ, both by what we say and by how we live. He tells us to not let the threats and the intimidation and the suffering keep us from sharing. Instead, he says we need to be ready to share our hope always. And understand, when we are suffering for doing good, we will be asked why. Why do you keep on worshiping this God who could take your suffering away? Why do you continue to tell people about him when he's the one you say who could take all of your pain away? Questions are going to rise when we are facing suffering, but we are facing it with joy and in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going to give us an opportunity to share why. The word for explain in verse 15 is the Greek word apologia, which means a strong defense. In other words, what Peter is saying is we need to be prepared to tell people what we believe, but we also need to be prepared to tell people why we believe. We need to be able to defend what we believe to a lost world. The truth is, our suffering is going to be an incredible platform for telling people about Jesus because we suffer differently than the people of this world. Now, if you haven't gone through suffering, you may not understand what I'm talking about. But I'm here to tell you, that if you're walking with Jesus in the midst of the most difficult suffering and pain you can imagine, he gives you a peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't mean that there isn't sorrow. It doesn't mean there isn't grief. It doesn't mean there isn't physical pain. It just means in the midst of whatever it is you're facing, he gives you peace. And if you're here and you're a believer and you've gone through times of suffering and you didn't have that, all I can tell you or rather, all I can ask you is, had you set apart Jesus as Lord of your life? I mean, had you given him every single part? Because maybe the reason you don't have that peace is because you were holding on to that part that you no longer have. And, and now you're not trusting him like you should. You see, our suffering is an incredible platform to share the hope that we have in Christ. And notice, that's what we share. We share the hope that we have because of Christ. You see, this world looks for its hope in the here and now. The world looks for its hope in if I can get that better job then. Or this next relationship is going to be a lot better. And hope is found in the here and now. But see, for those of us who are believers, <laughs> we know our hope isn't in this world. All we're promised in this world is suffering. I want you to look at me. Hear me. Praise God, most of us in this room have never experienced the suffering that these New Testament believers went through. But that's what we're promised. 
we're not promised an easy life. We're not promised a, a, a good existence with lots of money and lots of health. We're promised suffering if we seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. I, I, anything other than that is just simply a gift from God. We're promised suffering, and yet in the midst of our suffering, we have hope. Why? Because our hope isn't found in the here and now. My hope is in what's to come. You see, I know whatever happens in the here and now, I have something a whole lot better to look forward to. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if our hope in Christ is but a lie, we are of all people without hope. Because, you see, we're living our life looking forward to something else, not looking forward to the here and now. Our, our best, you know, a lot of people use this, this phrase, your best life now. Man, if your best life is now, I pity you. Because God's got something far better for each and every one of us. And we hope for that. We live with that hope no matter what befalls us. Someone said that you can live 40 days without food, you can live four days without water, you can live four minutes without air, but you can't live four seconds without hope. We need hope. And Jesus came so that in a world filled with sin, we can still have hope. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 21, it says in his name, Jesus' name will be the hope of all the world. We find our hope in Jesus and we need to be sharing that with everyone we can. Let me ask you a question. Do you have that hope? I mean, I, I don't mean to scare you. I'm not trying to do that. But understand, if Jesus doesn't come first, you're going to die. And you may have a long, lingering illness before you die. It may be painful. You may die suddenly. I don't know, but here's what I know. If Jesus doesn't come first, you're going to die. I'm going to die. So what's next? I mean, do you really have hope for what's next? Are you looking forward to what's next? The former president at New Orleans Seminary's wife died a couple weeks ago. I may have already shared this. If I have, forgive me, but... But his wife died several weeks ago and he posted on X, form, Twitter, formerly Twitter, but now on X. He said, the day after she died, he said, yesterday was the worst day of my life. But it was the best day of my wife's life. Because she exited this world and entered into glory. And she saw Jesus face to face. You see, that's the hope that we have. We have the hope that there's something far better than this world do you have that hope and if you have that hope are you sharing that hope with the world we got to move on number three peter tells us in verse 18 to remember christ's suffering he said christ suffered for our sins once for all time he never sinned but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to god he suffered physical death but he was raised to life in the spirit now in verse 18 peter moves from our suffering for doing good for Christ to Christ suffering for our sins. And don't ever forget Jesus suffered for your sins. He was beaten with fists and rods. A crown of thorns was, was thrust onto his head and, and it dug into his skull. He was beaten with a whip that tore the flesh from his body. He had to carry a cross to the streets of Jerusalem up a hill called Golgotha. There he was nailed to that cross in such a way that he had to struggle for every breath he breathed. And then he died. He died an agonizing death. He suffered physically for our sins. But his physical suffering was nothing compared to the spiritual suffering on the cross. Because the Bible tells us when he was on that cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you read through the Gospels, Jesus always referred to the Father as Father. 
But here on the cross, it says, God, my God, why have you forsaken And though people disagree, I believe that at that moment in time, Jesus was on that cross. The sin of all history, past, present, and future, was poured out on Jesus. All the wickedness, all the sorrow that it brings, all of the shame, all of the heartache, All of it was poured upon Jesus, the sinless Son of God. He took our sins upon himself so that you and I could experience his righteousness. And when he took that sin upon himself, God the Father had to turn away. The Father and the Son had been one Throughout all eternity. They had an intimate relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That was never broken. But at this moment in human history. Because he took our sin. The relationship. The fellowship. That had been experienced forever. Was broken. And Jesus experienced What we experience in sin. He took that upon himself because he loved us. And his was a sinless sacrifice. It says he was without sin. The just died for the unjust. And it was a one-time sacrifice. Never to be repeated again. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus suffered for our sin. But then we get to verse 19, and and I need to to share this with you. And as we get to verse 19, we know that it's the inspired word of God. It comes from the very mind of God, written through the pen of Peter. And yet, these verses, 19, 20, 21, 22, they have created a lot of confusion for God's people. Verse 19 and following is one of the most debated passages in the entire Bible. Since the apostolic era, that means the day of the apostles, there have been over 40 different views of how this passage is to be interpreted. Martin Luther said this. He said, this is a strange text. Certainly a more obscure passage than any other passage in the New Testament. And then Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, said this. He said, I still do not know for sure what the apostle means. Martin Luther said that. I mean, this is a tough text. But but let me tell you something before we dive in, okay, and read it. Whenever you're trying to understand a text, you first of all look at the context. When you're looking at a passage, you look at the passage in which it is written to try to understand it. And if that doesn't help you understand it, then you look at other text in the Bible to try to understand it. You never look at things outside the Bible to try to understand the Bible. You see, the Bible helps you understand things outside the Bible. Things outside the Bible don't help you understand the Bible. And so you look at the context, you look at other text, and you pray, and you seek God. Now, what we do know is in this context, Peter is writing to suffering believers, telling them how to live with peace and joy and even happiness in the midst of their suffering. So somehow, some way, these verses have to accomplish that task. Okay? So let's read what he says. It says after, you know, it says that Christ died for the unjust. Um, it says this. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience.
It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and the powers except his authority. I told you there's 40 different views, so let's look at all 40 for just a moment. Joking. Joking. The three views that are most common among evangelicals, those who hold the Bible to be true, I want to give them to you. Here's view number one. That between the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus went to a place called paradise. Some people say it's the Old Testament word for Sheol, but he went to paradise where the Old Testament saints were living, and he shared with them the gospel that he had overcome death by his blood, and he took those Old Testament saints to heaven. People who hold to that view say they believe that because it's tied to Ephesians chapter 4 where it says Jesus ascended and he had descended and he went and set the captives free. The problem with this is this passage clearly tells us that Jesus is preaching to those who were disobedient in Noah's day. So he's not preaching to Old Testament saints, he's preaching to Old Testament sinners. And he's specifically preaching to Old Testament sinners in Noah's day. And so I think that those who hold this view are wrong. So that leaves us with two views. Here's the second view. That between Jesus' death and resurrection, he went to a place called Tartarus, which is a Greek word for the prison where fallen angels, demons, some are kept until the day of judgment. We read about Tartarus in 2 Peter, and we read about Tartarus in Jude. And so they believe that Jesus went and he preached to them, not a message of salvation, but a message of victory. He went to proclaim that he had defeated sin and he had defeated death, and now they were utterly defeated by his power. And he put them under his foot, and then he went to heaven. Now, again, this passage says that he preached to those who were disobedient in Noah's day. And so how do you justify that? Well, what some people say is in Genesis chapter 6, this is the story of the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, there's a passage in verse 1 that says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they married them, and they had children, and they were the Nephilim, these giant men of renown who also, people say, were very wicked. And so these fallen angels possessed the sons of God, they're fallen angels, they possessed men, they had sex with women, and they had these children that became these giants, but not only were they giants, they were extremely wicked, and they led the world into a time of wickedness unlike the world has ever seen before. And so this is the people that Jesus went to proclaim to. It wasn't to, to save them, it was to proclaim that you're defeated, I've won the victory. Now, I, I think there are two problems with that, though this is one of the views that if you ask me on even, any given day, I would say, well, I believe that. But there are two problems with that. The, the one problem is, why is Jesus going to announce his victory to people he's already defeated? I mean, he's put them in the abyss. They are in the pit, waiting the final judgment. He's already defeated them. Why is he going to proclaim to them that he's victorious? He doesn't need to do that. The second problem with this interpretation is that phrase, sons of God, is found only four other times in the Old Testament. This passage and then four other times. And every time that it's found in the New Testament other than this, it's used not to describe demons, but it's used to describe angels that serve and follow the one true God. We read that in Psalm. We read that in Job. And so, why is it that this one time, demons are called sons of God? And so, that's a struggle with this. But, verse 22 would seem to give us some indication that this is how you interpret this. Because, verse 22 says, when Jesus went to heaven, the angels, the authorities, and the powers all saw that he had all authority. And so that would go with Jesus going to the underworld and proclaiming to these demons, I have all authority. You're defeated. And this would encourage and comfort the saints because 
they were going through a hellish time. I mean, anybody who has looked at history would know that what Nero did to the Christians were demonic. I mean, these people were possessed by demons. You couldn't do these kind of things um, just being in a fallen state of mind. They were evil, they were wicked, and to know that, that even in the midst of this, Jesus had won the victory would be encouraging to them. But there's a third view. And the third view is this has nothing to do with Jesus going and preaching somewhere between his death and resurrection. What it's saying is that Jesus went and preached in his spirit to those in prison. Now, remember Jesus said while he was here on earth that one of his primary ministries was to set the captives free. Jesus' ministry was all about setting captives free. Those who were held captive to to sickness, those who were held captive to demonic possession, those who were held captive to death with Lazarus and Jairus' daughter. He would set them free, but primarily to set the captives to to a, 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 a lost way of living. He wanted to set them free. That's what Jesus came to do. And so what this is saying here is not that, that Jesus preached to someone in the underworld, but rather during Noah's day, because it said he preached to the disobedient in Noah's day while God waited patiently. So in the Spirit, Jesus preached through Noah to those who were disobedient, urging them to repent before the judgment of God came. Now and you say, why would you even say that? What's any kind of proof text for that? Well, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Just turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, this is what it says. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. And so what Peter's saying here is the prophets of the Old Testament, even though Jesus had not come, they prophesied about his coming. And they wanted to know more about his coming because it so intrigued them. And then it says this. They wondered what time or situation. Listen, look what it says. The spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance what Christ's suffering, about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. And so it says that the spirit of Christ spoke to the prophets of old about his suffering and so understand this is nothing new the spirit of christ speaking to people and through people in the old testament and and so what i believe is that this is saying that during that time of rebellion when wickedness ruled the world jesus came and spoke through noah urging people to repent and turn And save themselves from the judgment that is to come. And Noah preached for hundreds of years. And you know how many people responded? Nobody. Noah preached. Rather, Jesus preached through Noah. And nobody responded. What does Peter tell the people to do in verse 15? It says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have in Jesus. In spite of suffering, in spite of what they say, in spite of what they do, tell people about Jesus. They may not respond, but tell people about Jesus. I believe what God is doing here is he's telling the people, you stay faithful. Nobody may listen to you. Nobody may respond. Nobody may give their life to Jesus, but you stay faithful. Jesus preached through Noah for a hundred years while the ark was being built, and nobody responded. If Jesus remained faithful and proclaimed with nobody responding, you can too. Remember the suffering of Jesus. One other thing I want to point out here that I think is important. It says in verse 20, chapter 3, verse 20, it talks about baptism. And it says, and that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. That's not telling you that baptism saves. But I want you to hear me. Look at me. This is important. I believe this passage along with Acts chapter 
2 is telling us that baptism is vital. If you have been saved and you have a clean conscience before God, you will want to be baptized. And if you're here and you say you're a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized, you need to ask yourself, why haven't I? Because this is vital to your Christian faith and walk with Jesus. Now let's move on. One final thing, you've been very patient. Peter tells us that if we want to survive and, and thrive, we need, to have a, we need to have Christ's attitude. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He says, so then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. Now notice what Peter's saying. He said, arm yourselves with the attitude of Christ. The attitude of Christ in the midst of suffering is a weapon in our war against sin and the God of this world. And he's telling us when we have the attitude of Christ, something happens with our desire for sin. We discover that we no longer long for the things we used to long for, but rather we long for a godly, righteous life. What, what Peter is saying here is God uses our suffering to overcome sin in our life if we allow he isn't saying that we become righteous through suffering, but what he is saying is God uses suffering in our life if we attack it the way God says, to take away the desire for sin in our life. So how can we look at the sufferings of life as a blessing from God? We worship God with all of our heart. We share Jesus by what we say and by how we live. We remember Christ suffered for us, and we seek to live with the attitude of Christ. And if we do those things, Peter says, you're not only not going to worry, you're not going to be afraid, you're going to be blessed and happy in the midst of suffering. That's what we need to strive to do, because suffering is going to come. Now, if you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus, understand, <laughs> suffering won't get you to heaven. There's nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. Your goodness is never going to be good enough. No matter how much you suffer for trying to do right. Your only hope is Jesus. He's the one who gives us hope. So if you're here and you've never turned from sin and trusted Jesus to be your Savior, surrendering your life to him as your Lord, then today I plead with you. Don't leave here without humbling yourself before God, turning from your sin, and asking Jesus to save you. That's why you're here today. He wants to save you. But if you're here and you're a Christian, I want you to prepare yourself. Suffering's coming. It's going to come. It may not be this year. It may not be next year. Who knows? We may even be spared from horrible suffering I don't know but the Bible says those who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution get ready and in closing all over the world we have brothers and sisters who aren't as fortunate as us they're not able to gather like we're gathering right now if they did, they would be arrested, they would be beaten, they would be thrown in prison. In Egypt, in Iran, in India, North Korea, all over the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering simply because they love Jesus. So this is what I want you to do. This morning, I'm asking you, if you need to give your life to Jesus, you come and you tell one of our pastors and let us walk you through how you can know Jesus in a personal way. If you're a Christian, I'm going to ask you to come to this altar. We may not have room, but as many as we can get, just take a moment to 
pray for the suffering believers all around the world. We're going to be with them for all eternity in heaven. Amen? I mean, the least we can do right now is pray for them as they face suffering and persecution. I want you to stand with me. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Father God, this is your time. And I simply ask you to have your way in each of our lives, beginning with me. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God speaks to your heart. You come. Don't wait on anyone else.